This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As thousands of Afghans attempt to flee Afghanistan before the U.S. withdrawal on August 31st, we turn now to look at how the Trump administration made it harder for Afghans who worked with the United States to apply and receive what is known as a SIV, a special immigrant visa. One former top aide to Mike Pence has placed the blame on Trump's xenophobic advisor Stephen Miller. Olivia Troy recently tweeted quote, there were cabinet meetings about this during the Trump administration, where Stephen Miller would peddle his racist hysteria about Iraq and Afghanistan. He and his enablers across government would undermine anyone who worked on solving the SIV, special immigrant visa issue, by devastating the system at DHS and state, she said. In recent weeks, Stephen Miller has repeatedly appeared on Fox News to criticize efforts to resettle Afghans in the United States. The Taliban has all of the control of the government now. So the notion that people could just show up at a checkpoint and demand resettlement into the United States so we could have any idea about their background, their belief system, where they come from, and now that the U.S.-backed government has fallen, it's just an impossibility. Resettling in America is not about solving a humanitarian crisis. It's about accomplishing an ideological objective so, to change America. That is Stephen Miller um, on Fox. We're joined now by Olivia Troy. She worked as a Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor to Vice President Mike Pence until she resigned in August of last year. She's now the director of the Republican Accountability Project. Uh, Olivia Troy, welcome to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us. Uh, can you talk more about I mean, you were in the room. So, so talk about what the Afghan visa process is. Um, we're talking about now a law passed by Congress. They have to go through something like 14 steps. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. And to hear Stephen Miller sort of just disregard the fact that these people are vetted so extensively. I mean, the process is cumbersome and it is challenging, uh, despite the Trump administration's attempts to really gut the entire thing. But, you know, they go—they have to be sponsored by either the military commander at the time or the person they were working for. Um, they have to get a letter, a recommendation from them. And then it's a series of steps. They go through health checks. They go through vetting. They go through background checks. I mean, this isn't something that just happens overnight. It is a cumbersome process that lasts at least several months. But in this situation, what we've had is that Many of these people were in the pipeline for years, just waiting to get through the process, and they never saw um, saw results. So describe a scene, describe a meeting um, that Stephen Miller was in, uh, talking about these Afghan allies. Now, he is continuing to talk about this to this day. But Stephen Miller does not hide the fact that he is anti-immigrant, anti-refugee. This is something that he has been consistent about from day one of the Trump administration when they took office. And you know, whether it was issuing the travel ban, as it's referred to, or and that in that travel ban, it was actually it called for a full stop of the refugee process to do security reviews and extra like and review vetting. Well, I sat in those meetings when we discussed many of these scenarios. And in these meetings, it was brought to the attention, especially before cabinet meetings and in senior staff meetings at the National Security Council, the importance of protecting these translators, these interpreters, these U.S. allies that have served on the ground with us and who needed to get through the process expeditiously. Uh, and Stephen Miller would say, well, these are terrorist cells in the making if you bring them here. He would say, these are going to be, what is it that you want? You guys want a bunch of little Iraqs throughout the United States? You want a bunch of stands everywhere in the country? And it was so offensive to many uh, it's senior military commanders and generals, you know, brass, um, military brass, offensive to intelligence career people so like myself. So who spoke up? Um, can you talk about General Mattis, for example, when he couldn't attend a meeting? Yes. So, uh, and he wrote a memo specifically about the P2 program on Iraqis. And I think this is happening in 2018 when we were discussing the refugee ceiling cap. And Stephen P2 Miller was program a big is similar to SIV, right? Yes, exactly. Um, and this conversation, you know, we were talking about SIV processes, we're talking about the P2s. Um, for Iraqi translators, many of these who had been in the pipeline for years already. 
And so General Mattis is not able to attend this cabinet meeting on the refugee ceiling discussion. And so he writes a memo and he writes this memo because he wants it to go on record and he wants it distributed at the meeting because he's concerned about what is going to happen when people come to the room. What is Pompeo going to do? Will he cave to the likes of Stephen Miller and his ilk? And he was right to be concerned because in this discussion, Stephen Miller pontificates once again and pushes this narrative of fear mongering about what's going to happen if we bring these people here. And Mattis pushes back through his memo uh, and make sure that it's, he's on record that if we do not protect this population, that if we don't get them through the process, this is a serious matter of national security, because what message are we sending to the world? You were a special advisor to Vice President Trump, uh, Vice President Pence. Did you feel you could stand up to Stephen Miller? Yes, but you always had to do it in a very calculated manner, because when you do take a stand, unfortunately, he did have the power to remove people from their positions. He would, he pushed a number of many of my competent colleagues out, uh, State Department, Foreign Service officers who were serving across the National Security Council, some of them known to be pro-refugee and pro-SIVs and pro-P2s. And many of these people get pushed out of the National Security Council and they're replaced by Stephen Miller allies. And so what I did was I worked closely with my colleagues to figure out how we were going to navigate this careful situation. And I look, I briefed Vice President, uh, former Vice President Pence um, about the scenario. I told him that I was meeting with numerous organizations who were raising serious concerns about what was happening here, whether it was budget cuts for the refugee resettlement programs for Afghans and Iraqis and other refugees. And they were kind of, they were asking the right question. They were saying, what is happening here? What's happening at the State Department? Well, when I dug into this and I actually go and meet people at the State Department, I find myself faced with one of Stephen Miller's uh, right out allies, um, one of his strongest supporters. And it all sort of comes together for me. And I come back and say, well, I, I don't know how we're going to counter what's happening here across the U.S. government when we have a group of people that are actively working to undermine the entire system. Uh, in a statement to The New York Times, uh, Stephen Miller responded to your accusations, saying, the sole reason anyone is stranded in Afghanistan is because Joe Biden stranded them there in the single most imbecilic act of strategic incompetence in human history. And, of course, uh, President Trump has weighed in, and he's attacking Biden, uh, calling his responses imbecilic as well. Your response, Olivia? Well, I think Trump had four years to uh, do something about getting these people out of harm's way who were in the system waiting to be processed. And so I think what you see now is a scenario where, you know, President Biden takes office, he comes in, they realize that the program is good. They've spoken about this before, where they come in and they realize that um, they're, the program is definitely in need of resourcing and staffing. And so this is not something that you can just flip a switch and turn on overnight. It's a cumbersome process. And if it's if it wasn't functioning, um, the way it should have, which I know that it wasn't, because I know this firsthand, it's going to take some time. And so you end up in a crisis situation now where you are trying to figure out how you're going to protect thousands of people whose lives are going to be at risk once we withdraw. If that were the case, and you know, I know for a fact that the you know, Trump administration was planning this withdrawal for several years now, why were they not actively prioritizing this population so that we wouldn't be in the situation we're in today?